So give it up for Allison. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bart. Um, as he said, I'm going to be talking about how algorithmic confounding in recommendation systems increases homogeneity and decreases utility. Um, so I want to talk about this feedback loop. Uh, oftentimes in recommendation systems, we have uh, dynamics that look a little bit like this, where we have a recommendation system platform that provides recommendations to users. Users then interact with those recommendations, and then what we do with those interactions is important. Sometimes we use those interactions with recommendations to evaluate other recommendation systems. Sometimes we use it to retrain our models or, you know, update our models so that it's passing through this feedback loop again, right? It's going back to the users in, in recommendations, and that can pose some problems, right? Because we're treating those, those interactions as if um, they are ground truth in terms of what the user actually wants, when in reality they're confounded by the algorithms that were already deployed in our systems. So I wanted to investigate this feedback loop a little bit. And so what we did is we built a simulated system because we can control that. Um, we're currently working on user studies um, to kind of explore this further. Um, but for this paper, what we did is we built up a simulation um, where we have users interacting with items in very much a matrix factorization style um, preference structure, although that doesn't give matrix factorization a particular edge in our results. Um, so here we're simulating the utility users get from interacting with different items. And we take all of these um, these different worlds that we create, so we created 10 different worlds, um, and we expose them to different alternative realities where users uh, experience content filtering recommendations, social filtering, matrix factorization, recommendations based on pop item popularity, random recommendations, and ideal recommendations based on the true utility um, of the simulation because that's the beauty of simulations. All right, so we wanted to see what happened as we go through this feedback loop um, in these different simulated worlds. Uh, and one thing we wanted to look at was um, the, the homogenization of user behavior. What happens to, to users uh, and, and their, their uh, behavior as, as we go through this feedback loop. So what we did is we took, for each user, we paired them with their most similar user um, in terms of preference space. So here it would be, you know, in popularity, it would just be any random user. For matrix factorization, um, each user would be paired with their most similar user in terms of Euclidean distance in the latent matrix space. Um, for social filtering, it would be their most trusted friend, so things like that. So we take each user, we pair them with their most similar user in preference space, and then we can compare the item sets that those users are consuming. And we can compute the Jacquard index, or the intersection of those items, over the union of those items. And here what we want to do isn't look at the raw Jacquard index, because in an ideal world, there will be some similarity between users because that's what these matrix factorization type and a lot of the um, collaborative filtering style recommendation systems are using, right? There are patterns. People do have similarities. And so there is an ideal amount of homogenization that we expect to find, right? You expect to have some things common, in common with your friends. Um, so what we want to measure is the relative change in the Jacquard index. Are you becoming too similar to your friends? Are you becoming more homogenous than the ideal? Right. So we looked at two, um, two cases of this. Um, the first uh, is a single training case. So here, um, the y-axis is your change in Jacquard index, with the zero line being the ideal homogenization, higher being more homogenous, lower being more heterogeneous. Uh, um, all right, so then in the single training case, what we did is we exposed users to random items for 50 iteration, then we trained all of the different matrix, or all of the different uh, recommendation algorithms, and then we just deployed those and let the, the simulations run with that single training instance of, of the systems. And here what we see is that all of the systems stay pretty close to the ideal level of homogenization. But then in the second case, when we do repeated training, so here we expose users to 10 iterations of random recommendations, and then we train each system, and then each consecutive iteration we're retraining based on all of the previous data. So we're retraining based on this algorithmically confounded data. And what we see is that homogenization skyrockets. We see lots of homogenization between users, and in particular, matrix factorization, content filtering, um, and social filtering all have a lot of homogenization. Now this is 
homogenization relative to their most similar user. If you're looking at um, relative to all users, um, so doing the same kind of matching that we do with popularity, then we see popularity homogenizes across the population the most, um, and then these other three styles of algorithms homogenize within, pop, you know, within populations. So this is kind of like the filter bubbles. You're seeing homogenization within the filter bubbles for these recommendation, um, these three recommendation systems, whereas other recommendation systems will homogenize across the population. All right, so this leads us to our first claim, which is that recommendation systems, or this, this recommendation feedback loop causes homogenization in user behavior. Now we also wanted to look at um, how this homogenization relates to utility. So here we have the same y-axis, so high homogenization on the top, but we're also plotting it um, against utility, right? So on the far right, you see close to ideal utility, and on the far left, you see very low utility. And the general pattern we see is that users that have high homogenization tend to have lower utility, and closer to ideal um, utility has lower homogenization. And again, this is just a general pattern. You see things on, on all sides of the spectrum, but the general trend is that um, users experiences losses in utility due to homogenization effects. But again, these losses are distributed unequally across users. <clears throat> All right, so the last thing we wanted to look at was uh, the distribution of items and how this feedback loop impacts the distribution of items. And so we have this, this typical curve, this long tail curve that we, we often talk about. Um, and here we can look at um, the Gini coefficient, which just graphically is the, um, the items, or the, the area of uh, above that curve up to the line of equality divided by the area under the line of equality. So it ranges from zero to one, zero being maximal equality and one being maximal inequality. And if we look at that for these different systems, again, this is the end of case two, um, as sort of the, the systems have, have run for a while. We see that uh, content filtering is actually really similar in terms of the ideal um, Gini coefficient, so the ideal distribution of items. Whereas matrix factorization and social filtering um, kind of push uh, the, the item distribution to be more unequal than it would be the, in the ideal case. And popularity, as to be expected, pushes things even further. The thing that I found particularly of interest is that there's not a real correlation with um, the change in Jacquard index, so the change in homogenization. So you can see changes in item distribution without correlation to changes in homogenization of user behavior. So what we're seeing is these are distinct phenomenon that, can, that we need to investigate separately. Right. So our third claim is that the feedback loop amplifies the impact of recommendations, or of recommendation systems on the distribution of item consumption. All right, so why do we need to think about algorithmic confounding? Well, the first thing is we want better evaluation of recommendation systems. This is a phenomenon that exists in a lot of the data that we collect, right? A lot of the free data that's out there that researchers use or that we use within our companies has already been impacted by recommendation systems. So how are we treating that? Are we treating it as if it's the perfect data that users want to behave exactly like that? Or do we you know, weight it and consider uh, the impact of the recommendation systems that have already been deployed? Um, and that can lead to better offline or, um, or industry evaluations of, of these recommendation systems. We also want to understand the impacts on human behavior. So as we're, as we're using these, these recommendation systems to uh, improve our platforms or even just do research, um, we want to understand you know, how these systems are actually impacting people. And we can't do that if, um, if our analyses are confounded by, um, by the, again, this algorithm confounding. So we need to really tease that apart in, under, in order to understand the causal impact on human behavior of these systems. Um, and, and we'll use all of this to design better systems to increase fairness and social welfare and to increase you know, profit, right? Um, we like to think that as users are happier, that's gonna be better for companies, better for society. So again, better evaluation, understand impacts on human behavior, and we wanted to design better systems. So we really need to be thinking about algorithmic confounding in order to, to make these changes happen. Thank you.
perfectly on time, so we have some time for questions. Um, yes, over here. Uh, thanks. Uh, Omar from Microsoft. Uh, I was wondering if uh, in, in the better evaluation uh, idea, like, uh, did you find any sort of metrics that you could use to measure, uh, I don't know, maybe diversity in recommendations or, or things like that? Right. Um, so I don't know. There are, I mean, there are a bunch of metrics out there for, um, for evaluating different aspects of recommendation systems. Here, I was in particular thinking about, um, about just including, um, well, I mean, one thing is to include these, these other metrics. I didn't explore the impact on all of the different metrics. I, I primarily focused on the ones that we talked about today, but I think that there's a lot of open area for work in terms of evaluating what are the, the evaluation metrics, and we have a whole session on that later today um, about metrics and evaluation. Um, but I think it's just, it's a piece of the puzzle. So, I mean, all I can say to that is that I think it's really important f for us to be thinking deeply, but identifying exactly what those metrics are was outside of the scope of this work. Hi, you mean Sofa from TripAdvisor. First of all, thank you for this work that was needed for a long, long time. Um, my first question is how the result change if you checked uh, regarding the change sensitivity of the result to the parameters of the simulation? Um, that's the first question. The second question is it's uh, more and more com it's common for uh, today uh, to actually introduce some noise in the recommendations and I wonder how does that affect, does that prevent actually all the negative effects that, that you showed? Okay. I didn't quite understand this second question, but I'll answer the no. first one um, in terms of how the duration impacts it. So if you have a longer time, it, as if your feedback loop is longer, uh, longer duration, then these, uh, the effects of this are going to be spread out over time more. So you're not going to see the effects uh, as strongly. So if you did, in, again, in the simulations, if it, you retrained every 10 iterations instead of every iteration, you're going to see these effects happening more slowly. The reason we did every iteration is just because we wanted to show the extreme version of this. But, you know, if you're, retra it's basically like, are you retraining your models every day um, as you're deploying them? Are you retraining them every week? Um, if you're training every day, you're going to have more problems than if you're training every week or every month. Um, and so, so could you repeat your second question? So the second question is that um, it's actually common uh, to introduce some perturbation to the recommendation. Mm -hmm. So in order to actually overcome exactly those problems. And I was wondering if you uh, had the chance to look at what happened when we actually do that, how does that affect the result? So I didn't look at perturbation. I looked at some weighting techniques. And those uh, were fairly effective in countering these, um, but not universally. Um, so I think there's some, some care to be thinking about in terms of waiting. I, I, I think uh, exploring the, the perturbations would be an excellent idea as well, or maybe a combination of the two. Yeah. All right, then over here, one more. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's a very important topic for practical uh, applications. Maybe you can clarify something. So uh, you mentioned the, uh, synthetic behavior or simulation. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how you are uh, modeling users in that behavior. I'm imagining there's a recommendation system that makes recommendations and then the synthetic users make a decision. I'm curious how that, uh, that is modeled. Right, so the, the paper has all of the details on that, but the, the high level is that users um, have a noisy representation of their utility. So the, we're recommending recommended items interleaved with uh, new items. So every iteration, we're introducing new items. Um, so they're, they're able to choose between both of those. Um, the second point is that they, users have a noisy uh, perception of their utility. So they kind of, um, they know some per random percentage of the utility. So they can kind of guess what is going to be useful to them, but they don't have the full picture. So then utility, uh, it's true utility was the, the graph that I showed before, um, but then users only know a portion of that, and they know a random portion of that for each item. So it's, again, they're, they're noisily choosing what they think they're going to like, um, which is correlated with what they're actually going to like, but it, it's not. It's probabilistic. Distribution of users with different utilities, and then those utilities, I'm assuming, are consistent with their past purchases. 
that you train the recommendation system with. Sorry, there. So the users have uh, distributions, different users have different utilities. Mm -hmm. yes. And they, I'm assuming they also have some purchase history or uh, item interaction history yeah. that you train on. Mm -hmm. And the utilities are kind of consistent with those. Uh, yeah, they're consistent. So we, I mean, we basically model users in, in sort of a matrix factorization pattern. There are lots of different ways you can do it, but you basically have a, a vector of vector representation of your preference set, and we use that to construct the true utilities. Um, and then we also use that to construct the noisy representation of their utilities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>